Well, good morning from me. Good to be with you again this morning as we carry on looking through the book of Ephesians. Now, for those of you with us here in church, hopefully you've got a handout with your service sheet that should um, show you a little bit where I'm hoping to go with this passage today. But, as you have heard from our Bible reading, there's some challenging things for us to consider in our Bible reading today. So let's turn to God and ask for his help as we do that. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you are good. Thank you that you are holy and thank you that you speak to us through your word. Help us, Lord, to understand what you want to say to us today from Ephesians 5. By your spirit, Lord, soften our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, I'm just going to um, set my timer so I know where I'm up to. You'll be reassured to hear. <laughs> yeah, well, now, obviously, in today's passage from Ephesians chapter 5, I would encourage you to have it open, if you can, in front of you, on page 1176. Uh, we're going to be thinking about things like gender-based roles. We're going to be thinking about submission. We're going to be thinking about headship. All things which are very countercultural today in 2022. And they were back in Paul's time as well. Now, uh, many of us, when it comes to marriage are in different situations, okay? Some are happily married. Some are waiting to get married. Some were married, but are no longer. For a whole range of different reasons, whether that's broken relationships, whether that's divorce, whether that's bereavement, We've got to be real and say that some are married and may wish that they weren't. Some are desperate to be married, but aren't. And it doesn't look like it's going to happen on the radar. Some are contentedly single. So what we're dealing with today in Ephesians chapter 5 is like the fine china of people's lives. Fine china. It's lovely, but it's easily broken and damaged. Okay? So we're going to tread carefully, we're going to tread gently, but we're going to also tread with a clear view of the authority of God's Word, the Bible, that He knows best, and that there's hope and forgiveness for all of us, whatever our situation. Okay? And what we're looking at today in Ephesians chapter 5, it follows on from the whole of the book. So if you remember, chapters 1 to 3 of Ephesians gives us a wonderful picture of the gospel message. And then chapter 4 verse 1 reminds us, because of the gospel, that we need to live a life worthy of the calling we've received. So because of the gospel, this is how you live your lives. And then at the start of chapter 5 verses 1 and 2, we were told and reminded to follow God's example of love as shown to us through Jesus and his self-sacrifice. And then last week we were thinking about what it looked like to live a spirit-filled life. And there are specific instructions today to husbands and to wives. Uh, but when the idea of submission or headship is mentioned, it would be quite easy for the hackles to go up. Some may be even inwardly fuming that we could even talk about these things. And so because of that, we're going to look at the instruction to the guys first, to give the instructions, uh, because that gives a context for the instruction to wives, okay, even though it comes in the other order in the passage, the wives came first and then the husbands, we're going to look at the husbands first, so, on your handout, and also on the slide here, oh, missed that one, anyway, we're going to see that the spirit-filled husband follows the example of Jesus, okay, the spirit-filled husband follows the example of Jesus, now, it's the instruction to wives, isn't it, that gets all the headlines in verses 22 to 24. But what is often missed, ignored, or simply not comprehended is the instruction to husbands. And guys, the instruction for husbands is more than double the length of 
the one to the wives. It's 115 words compared to 40. And for many ways, it's more challenging. Okay? Hear me out before anybody throws anything. It's alright, for those of you watching online, nobody is threatening to throw anything. Right. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 says this. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So, strikingly, husbands are not instructed to rule or to lead their wives. What are they instructed to do in verse 25? Yeah. To love them. Brilliant. So let's get that clear from the start. That is how husbands are to act towards their wives. Everything they are to do is to flow from love. Now, of course, we've just uh, been reminded of Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, and all Christians are to be living lives of love following the example of Jesus. But here we're talking specifically about what that looks like in the marriage scenario, because there is something unique about that relationship. And we're going to break down the instruction to husbands into two parts. Okay? Firstly, husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. So look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. So, what is the model of love that husbands are to follow? It's the model of Jesus. And what did he do? He died for the church. He stopped at nothing to provide for the church. Husbands, we are to follow that example and how we love our wives. We have to be willing to pay the ultimate cost for her well-being. And what well-being is being considered here? Well, Jesus died for the church, we read in verse 26, to make her holy. So husbands, the primary aim we should have for our wives, through our love and sacrificial service to her, is that she grows in holiness. Husbands are to be concerned first and foremost with the holiness of their wives, not their happiness. Hmm, that might be a surprise to you, okay? Husbands, do you see that as the aim of your marriage? That you would play your part in helping to get your wife ready to meet the Lord Jesus by encouraging her in holiness. Just as Jesus died for the church to make us holy and through his sacrifice was able to present us holy and blameless to God without stain, wrinkle or blemish at all. Husbands, how do we do that? By loving, uh, by loving and following the example of Jesus in that massively sacrificial way. Uh, one of the guys who's been uh, reading uh, on the commentators of Ephesians, Simon Austin, puts it like this. Is it on here? Yeah, it might be hard to read, but it's on the screen. The first motivation given to husbands is, therefore, a remarkably high calling. This total concern for the well-being and the future perfection of the church is the model for Christian marriage. It's both self-sacrificial, a husband should give himself up for his wife, and self-denying. A husband should put the total well-being and spiritual perfection of his wife above his own desires. This is far from the notion of headship that many will have before reading this text. It's totally different, isn't it? And so, secondly, husbands are to love their wives as their own body. This is in verses 28 to 32. Let's look at those again. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. This is a really powerful image, okay? Not only do we care for our own bodies, so feeding, washing, clothing them, but the Lord Jesus cares for and provides for us, his church, his body. And so, it would be unthinkable if Jesus didn't care for his church, just like it would be unthinkable for us not to watch over our own bodies. And so it would be unthinkable for a husband to behave in any other way towards his wife. 
If he did with this picture, he would be damaging himself in some way and distorting the picture of the gospel which marriage provides. So but bear with me on this. Okay? In marriage, self-care is shown in wife care. And then Paul goes back to Genesis 2 to help us understand more what is going on. He's saying these massive commands on husbands in the story of the whole Bible. So Genesis chapter 2 verse 24 reminds us that for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So husbands and wives are united together in a way that uh, can be replicated by no other relationship. They are complementary in a completely unique way. I don't need to lay out the details uh, any more clearly than that. Just the physiology of our bodies is a clear indicator of this. This is, incidentally, why the Bible's view of marriage is that it's for one man and one woman, and no other variation on it. And this is what we should be feeding back as part of our loving, gentle, but clear interaction with the living in love and faith materials that we've been uh, looking at over recent weeks and months. But this unity is expressed between the man and the woman as a spirit-filled husband sacrificially loves his wife as Christ loved the church. And as a spirit-filled husband loves his wife as himself. It shows a profound mystery. A mystery that has been revealed, we've already looked at it in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, a few weeks ago. We see it here again. Marriage is an earthly picture of the love and relationship of Christ with his bride, the church. Now, uh, think, if you can, of the most wonderful marriage relationship you have seen. It might be your own, but it might not be. It may be the marriage relationship of a family member that you have observed or some family friends. The marriage relationship of a husband and wife is a deep picture of the love that Jesus has for his church. And it's incredible that God will choose to use the closest, most intimate, most committed relationship we can experience on earth as a picture for how he loves his people. It's mind-blowing. And how husbands sacrificially give themselves up for their wives is a way of expressing this. You see, marriage rightly lived is a foretaste of the future. Now, reality check. Husbands, here this morning, none of us love our wives perfectly in this way. None of us who are husbands in this room today. So, we need to come to God for forgiveness. We do. We need to stop and think, what is our primary concern for our wives? Is it that we can do all that we can to present them holy and blameless before the Lord Jesus? That should be our primary aim. Another thing to think through, are there areas of your life, husbands, where you need to dial down your preferences in order to sacrificially give yourself up for your wife. I need to be thinking about that as well. All of these things. So husbands, there's a few things to think through there. Wives, how can you encourage your husbands in this? Are there things where you can acknowledge self-sacrifice or say thank you? And for those of us not married, for whatever reason, just look at the picture that marriage does give of the future. You may not be perfectly married now, but if you're a Christian, one day you will be to Jesus. And you will experience all that marriage has to offer, but not imperfectly like here on earth but perfectly with the perfect husband, the Lord Jesus. So, that's instructions to husbands. Ah, challenging, isn't it? Follow the example of Jesus. Wow. Guys, we've got a lot to step up to. And it's in this context that we get the instructions for wives in verses 22 to 24. But check this out. 
The spirit-filled wife follows the example of Jesus as well. The spirit-filled husband follows the example of Jesus and the spirit-filled wife follows the example of Jesus. Let's have a look at verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the saviour. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. So, here we've got the idea, haven't we, of submission and headship. But let's be very clear, right from the start, when we hear submission and headship in the Bible, we are not thinking about misogyny. We're not. We're not thinking about male dominance. We're not thinking about abuse. We're not thinking about domestic abuse. We're not thinking about husbands always getting their way. Because remember what we've just learned about husbands following the example of Jesus. The word used here for submit indicates its voluntary nature. Paul does not have coercion in mind, but rather a willful, gospel-driven submission from wife to husband which originates from a right relationship with Jesus. He says in verse 22, as you do to the Lord. So why does Paul say that wives should submit to their husbands? Well, it's based on who God is. Look at verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the saviour. It's all based on Jesus being the head of the church, the one who rules the church. And what kind of rule do we see Jesus exert? Is it domineering? Is it abusive? Is it overwhelming? No. It's beautiful, isn't it? We've seen the nature of Jesus' rule, and we're going to think about it uh, when we sing our next song in a few moments, The Servant King. His headship is for the church. He has our best interests at heart. Wives are, sub are to submit to a headship that is expressed in love and self-sacrifice. So it looks a bit like this. Uh, you know, uh, the Titanic. Imagine uh, you're there, there's a husband and wife, they're on the Titanic, it's going down, they end up in the water, and there's a lifeboat ahead of them. They swim to the lifeboat, and there's one space on it. What does this headship and submission look like? It looks like the husband saying to the wife, get in. That's what we're talking about. Another quote here from Simon Austin again. He says, it's our voluntary submission to Christ which is the model for a wife's submission to her husband, looking to its head for its beneficial rule, living by his norms, experiencing his presence and love, receiving from him gifts that will enable growth to maturity. This is not, therefore, listen carefully to this, a license to submit to that which does not submit to Christ. Rightly lived, this model can never be an excuse to promote sin. Nor is it an excuse for husbands to enforce submission. Rather, it's the kind of voluntary and joyful submission with which the believer responds to Christ. So how is a submissive wife following the example of Jesus? Well, it's because Jesus was submissive to his Father's will. He did what his Father wanted, willingly, out of joyful and loving submission to him. So both husbands and wives are to follow the example of Jesus. Just another quote this time from uh, a lady called Kathy Keller, who's the wife of an American pastor called Tim. She says this, Headship is something given by one person to another. The giver can be equal to the receiver. The receiver has a real and final authority, but uses it only to serve and please up the giver. It's not used for yourself, because that is not how Jesus used his headship, is it? Jesus stripped himself. He washed his disciples' feet and he said, look what I've done. I'm the master and I'm giving you an example. I'm redefining what leadership, what authority means. It means serving. In marriage, this means that the head must never use his authority to please himself. The husband may never overrule his wife just to get his way and do what he wants. 
The head sacrifices his wants and his needs to please and build up his partner. Now, there is a lot to think about here in these verses, isn't there? As we look at our marriages, past and present, what we want them to be in the future, let me remind you we're dealing with the fine china of people's lives. Thank God that we can deal with the fine china of our lives with the Lord Jesus, who is tender, who is loving, who is kind, who is full of grace and mercy. There are actions here for every husband and wife in our congregation and whatever situation you're in. We all need to ask for forgiveness for where we fall short in following Jesus in our respective situations and in our respective roles. But let's thank God that marriage pictures the gospel. And that when we are unfaithful, God is always faithful to us. We can come to him for forgiveness. And thank God too that he fills us with his spirit to enable us to follow him in all of our relationships. And if you're struggling in your marriage, or if you're struggling with the situation you find yourself in, then don't feel isolated. Please come and talk, either to me or to a trusted Christian friend. The way things are now doesn't mean they always have to be that way in the future. And just a brief note here about the idea of gender roles. You know, although in our culture it's not okay to talk about this, as Christians we mustn't be ashamed. God made us male and female, and that's great. We're equal, but we're different. We have different roles. Husbands, one of my jobs is to encourage you to challenge myself to step up to the mark and to serve and love our wives self-sacrificially, just like that illustration from the Titanic. So husbands, what does that look like when you want to watch something and your wife wants to watch something different? In the nitty gritty. Wives, let's lovingly and willingly submit to our husbands as we follow the amazing example of the Lord Jesus. Because both husbands and wives who are spirit filled are both called to follow the example of Jesus. I'm going to finish with one more quote from a guy called Richard Cokin, who's also written a really helpful book on Ephesians. It's quite a long quote, so bear with me. Okay, he says this. If we struggle to understand how Christ loves us, think of an utterly devoted husband. If we struggle to understand how to please Jesus, think of a beautifully supportive wife. And if we're single, widowed, or divorced, we mustn't miss where Paul directs our attention. Not towards human marriage, but towards the marriage of Christ and his church, which every believer can look forward to. Equally, if we are married and painfully aware that our marriage is far from ideal, we must remember that it can only ever be a shadow of our future marriage in heaven, when we shall all be united with Christ at the most glorious wedding banquet, to enjoy a never-ending honeymoon in the new creation paradise, and experience perfect marital bliss. Christian, that's where you're heading. That's brilliant. None of us will miss out. We will all experience intimate and ecstatic satisfaction in our union with Christ in eternity. And then this last bit of the quote's on your sheet. It says this, The Bible is the story of God choosing a wife for his son, and astonishingly choosing wretched sinners like us to be that bride. And so to enjoy his marvellous grace. Our happy marriage to Christ is the goal of history. And every earthly marriage, whether as a beautiful comparison or as an ugly contrast, is a powerful reminder of it. Lots to think about. Lots to pray about. Lots to thank God for. Uh, let me pray. Father, thank you for the Lord Jesus. Father, we want to be more like him. In whatever situation we find us in, ourselves in, help us, Lord, to be more like Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. James.